This is the e-learning podcast, episode number 11. We have students from around the world. And so we're very aware that culture matters, context matters. However, uh, and this is, this is true to the UN too, there's much, much more that connects us as a human family that we share than that's different. Welcome to the e-learning podcast from LMSPulse.com. My name is Stephen Laddick, and I'm the director at LMS Pulse. If you don't figure out how to do your courses online, you're out of business. These are the words from my guest for today's episode. Mohit Mukherjee is an expert in organizational development, positive psychology, social entrepreneurialism, and the founding director of the Center for Executive Education at the University of Peace, a United Nations established institution. Mohit has been a pioneer in both the social entrepreneurship space and virtual education for many years. He's been particularly focused on graduate and continuing education programs, which in the case of the UN, these have faced challenges from creating courses where people from literally all over the globe have a chance to participate. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this conversation as much as we did, where we talk about the idea of online virtuosity where we realize that success in online learning is not a matter of technology or a checklist, but your ability to play the music for a specific group of human beings that are participating in your course. We also talk about what learning-centered design is all about and why it stayed relevant in 2020. We also talk about the importance of virtual leadership or being able to figure out future needs, assess risk and take action to guarantee success in online learning. And finally, we talk about Mohit's thoughts on the new normal and where a pioneer's mind is now that everyone is already where he is used to being. But before we get started, a quick word from our sponsors. The eLearning Podcast is sponsored by the eLearning Success Summit. Learn from more than 40 experts how to teach, work, and learn online without being overwhelmed. Get your free ticket to the summit at eLearningSuccessSummit.com and lmspulse.com, your best source for news, information, and resources for e-learning professionals for more than 10 years. Get our free roundup of the week's top news at lmspulse.com. Hey, Mo, welcome to the show. Hi, Stephen. Great, great to be on. Thank you. You know, Mo, I, we see in the background there, and for those people who are just listening to the podcast right now, I can see behind Mohit, the University of Peace, you know, there's people holding hands in a green field. There's, you know, the dub of peace and this and that. I don't think that's where you're sitting, though. Where, where, where are you at today? Yeah, I'm actually in West Palm Beach, Florida. And uh, I did put this virtual backdrop on just a couple of days ago. And I've had a lot of people saying, well, you're back in Costa Rica, yeah. which is where <laughs> the headquarters of the University for Peace is. But no. Yeah. Just so, so I, I want to give a little background, even though people have heard it in the preamble. I want you to tell the story. I'm not going to tell it too much. You're the executive director of uh, University of Peace, the Center for Ed- Executive Education. Um, I'm, I'm, that's where I'm going to stop. You tell, tell me the story behind how the genesis of that, uh, that particular center, um, how you ended up there. And then I want to jump into, you know, why I think it's important to have you on this show. Uh, I think this, there's a great unique story to tell here. We'll go from there. Yeah. So, you know, I got to know the University for Peace um, around 2005, 2006. And um, at that time, so it's, it's this beautiful campus in Costa Rica. The university itself was established by the United Nations back in the 1980s. And, and so it's, it's, it's an inspiring place. Uh, great potential. And when, when I discovered the university, it had two master's programs and about uh, 25 students there. And, and admittedly, it was just launching and growing. Um, but I realized that the only way to engage with, with the learning and the institution was through a one-year full-time master's program. And so what I propose to the university is that um, they allow me to actually set up a center for executive education that could offer um, programs under the university's mission, um, but much more flexible, allowing a lot more people to kind of engage with the university and its offerings. And so, so that was 15 years ago now that I launched the center. And, and sure enough, I mean, obviously the 
university itself has has grown. We have about 150 master students from around the world. Um, but the executive ed programs have more than twice that number coming through every year um, mm. because our programs are, are much more flexible short term. So, so, so it's been definitely a win-win kind of uh, scenario. Super cool. And so now to follow that up and, and fulfill my promise, the reason why I want to have you on the show, not only because I've known you for so long and, and I, I think you're going to just have some great insights into this for this audience, but you've been doing this for such a long time that, that you have an arc that started in the, you know, the traditional classroom discovered virtuosity to bring a blended classroom. And, you know, now that we've, we're sort of passing through COVID, you've gone full virtual and you're looking to expand your full virtual, you know, uh, sort of portfolio that the, the center offers. Um, and I want to sort of talk through that scenario. We've been talking on the podcast a lot to people about very specific, either tech or really specific, you know, um, classroom experiences or, or pedagogy, those kinds of things. And I, I think there's a great way to connect here with many of the people who are uh, listening to this show about how did we get here? You know what I mean? How do we, how do we get to where we are today? And, and what are some of the pitfalls along the way? And, and just as a sort of a great reminder of, holy smokes, we've made such leaps and bounds over the last decade to going from, okay, you show up in class, here's the syllabus, you know, there's the professor, let's lecture, to what we're doing right now, Zoom, right? So when did you, I guess, you know, you started offering classes, uh, you know, at the center, was it, was it, did, no, do I have it right? Was it super traditional, right? People flew in, you did a seminar, you did a thing, and then you tell me how it kind of started out. Yeah, uh, I exactly that. You know, I thought, um, let's, let's offer a more flexible short-term format. So we had, for example, a, a three-day leadership workshop and, and people would um, we still call it positive leadership. Um, people would come in from different countries, have this uh, very engaging experience. But er I mean, every time we ran one of these short workshops, we would get applicants from places like I'm myself originally from India, from my country or Kenya or even Europe saying, would love to be at this workshop, but either can't get the visa for Costa Rica, can't justify the travel expenses. So um, what we did, you know, this, so the center launched 15 years ago, but about 10 years ago is when we just took the plunge and said, let's look at setting up online courses for uh, our audience that uh, can't make it to Costa Rica. And there, you know, similar to a lot of viewers of, of, of this episode, um, our, our audience is adult learners. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, we took on, I think, two challenges when we created our first online courses is one is, uh, let's make it as engaging as possible. Um, but secondly, let's make it as flexible as possible, given that people are coming in from different time zones and they have typically full-time jobs. So that original design just required one hour of kind of a live webinar a week. Uh, and these, these were typically structured as four week or six week online courses. So um, really there was a lot of flexibility around the learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, that's worked quite well. However, what, uh, what I realized fairly early on is that th there were in fact two different offerings. Let's say if you took a three day immersive leadership workshop in country, in person, uh, that was a, the online course was different. It was over a much longer period of time. It was assuming that uh, you are not blocking time on your calendar to join live sessions. Even the one hour a week webinar was recorded. So it was really structured to allow complete flexibility. And so the, the, the change that's happened, I think in the last, uh, you know, hundred days, and I'm, I'm not counting, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, you, so we, we've, we've now said, okay, the, the, the live in-person workshops, what does that look like? And we're calling it live online. So we've, we continue to do kind of our four to six week online courses for, for learners around the world who want complete flexibility. But we've also, and I would say fairly successfully translated these immersive experiences into immersive online experiences where we do ask people to block you know, three hours on your calendar. We don't do, so far we haven't done anything that requires more than three hours at a time uh, per day, but we've taken, let's say a 16 hour 
two-day workshop and put it into a four-day period instead mm-hmm. or you know, mm-hmm. reduce the time a little bit. So I can talk a little bit more about that journey. Um, but I think it, that's something that, again, the, the, the COVID situation has really, I'd say, forced us to create something that we should have probably created a long time ago because that's quite different from a completely flexible online experience. So I'm, I'm interested to see, and what's really dawned on me and I hate to say this, uh, you know, now that we're, we're, we're kind of in the middle of the episode here, mm. is that, you know, one of the key conversations that's happening right now is just sort of the disruption that's happening to the higher ed space overall. And it sounds like, I mean, you were a disruptor 10 years ago. You mm. went to the university and said, hey, look, you've only got this one pathway in. Why don't we offer some, some different opportunities? And then you're like, well, let's, let's even offer, you know, an online opportunity. Did it feel the same way, back, you know, 10 years ago that you were like, look, I'm, I'm on the bleeding edge here. Uh, was the administration just like, oh, yeah, go for it. You know, this is great. Let, let's run with it. Was, was there resistance? And the reason why I'm asking that is, do you see the same thing happening now where universities or especially university pieces just trying to figure out where do we fit now and, and how do we deliver and what, you know, what are student expectations for what it, not only what a degree is going to offer, but how they, how they, how they receive it? So, great question. I'm reflecting on it as I answer. I think 10 years ago, yeah, I did feel like a disruptor in the sense that there were many reasons universities were were shying away from taking that leap, right? What's Mm -hmm. that going to do to the business model? Um, If we start offering online programs, uh, is it going to cannibalize our own face-to-face programs? Uh, I think a big big resistance was people getting their head around it, right? Mm. Like, how is this going to work? How am I going to interact? Um, And so, so there was a a technology piece. There was a a kind of a a business model piece. And then I think anyone taking on something new uh, in the online space, there wasn't necessarily the necessity yet to do it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I felt like, I, I want to try this. What's the worst case scenario? Uh, by the way, I love learning. What an opportunity to learn and meet our our kind, you know, our potential uh, students' needs who can't travel to go. So there were many many reasons why I was I was happy to make that leap of faith. And and quick anecdote, I I we we launched. Our, we kind of advertised our first online course. I hadn't built it yet. I wanted to make sure that I have a number of students before I build it. And the, the, we, we got to that number. And then I started having uh, sleepless nights, you know, because I was like, I, I don't oh, no. really know. <laughs> no, so it's, <laughs> just admit it's, it's uh, and it, it did take a lot of um, that, that I, I got to get it done because the course kicks off and I don't exactly know what I'm doing and I'm hoping that it comes out well because I'm, I'm committed to this, mm-hmm. yet I have, um, have not done it before. And so, so it, it was a stressful experience. Very glad I, I, I took it on. I think fast forward 10 years, um, by, by the way, uh, and then the University for Peace also did it to that they now have a fully online master's program. So they did need someone to kind of try it out and, and, and show them the way. Everybody needs that. an icebreaker, sure. You know, everybody needs sure. to, to take the lead and, hey, look, and, and I want, you know, finish, I want to finish your story, but circle back, like, I want to hear some of those fails along the way. You know, like, that's, that. So, but anyway, yeah. let's tie <laughs> yeah. this in a bow. <laughs> yeah, I, so I think now we're in a very different time. I think now it's, it's, if you don't do that, if you don't figure out how to deliver your face-to-face programs online, you're out of business, mm-hmm. right? So what a lot of universities have done, so, so my wife, for example, works at Palm Beach State College, big community college. When, when COVID broke, they just told their professors, uh, you know, deliver online. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, we're, we're, they, there was no necessarily, so, so some faculty were already doing some online and some face-to-face. So they didn't have a, necessarily a problem to try to figure out what that meant, but there were other faculty who were only teaching online and they didn't know what that meant. Mm-hmm. Right? And so of course there was some kind of task force created, you know, help your peers figure it out. But uh, it, it was a necessity, 
right? They weren't going to refund the students their tuition. The students needed to finish the program. And, and with the fall, they haven't yet made the call. But plan A is to continue online. Mm. So uh, very different um, situation and circumstance. And I think people who are, let's say, I, and I've seen institutions that are just delaying their start date in the fall because they don't want to put their head around what it would take to not just deliver online, but deliver it, it well. Right. right? So I think, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think, I think that's, I wouldn't advocate for, for that position. I'd say what an opportunity to really figure out um, what it means to take something like a design thinking workshop. Right. And, and I'm sure a number of audience members are, I'm familiar with design thinking, but but very hands-on. One of the first things I do in my design thinking workshop is you build something out of uh, materials. It's a prototype and you show it to your partner who you built it for. Like, what does that look like in the virtual world? Mm. Um, and maybe the last thing I want to say on this is I've done a lot of kind of best practices for engaging people virtually and I can get to some of the failure stories. I don't think there is a... a a formula for doing this, um, whether it's the technology or it's, it's very different if you're looking at young undergrads and trying to say, hey, everyone put on your Zoom camera. W- what does that create in a teenage girl, right? The mm-hmm. fact that everyone's now staring at her. She's just totally distracted staring at herself and wondering if she should have a different virtual background or if her hair is okay. So, so yes, good to have people put on their camera like that, but no, it, it, it's not always the case with, with every audience. So I, I, I'm just finding that I come back to, I think one thing you piece is really good at is, is, is this idea of empathy, right? Mm. And um, so who's the audience? What are you trying to achieve as an educator? What is the audience trying to achieve? And that will determine the technology, the camera usage, the interactivity. It's, it's just not that easy, <laughs> which, which is kind of cool because I don't think education should be easy. I think it's a highly relational, personalized journey and, and it is online too. Yeah. It, it sounds like if I can paraphrase what you're talking about, and maybe this is a conclusion I've already made myself, uh, is humans are messy. Human relationships are messy, you know, and so the relationship factor when you're, you know, on a stage or in front of a class trying to impart knowledge or either coach people through knowledge discovery, it's a messy process, right? And uh, the variables that you, you're going to have with each of the students are going to be tremendous. You're going to have some introverts, you're going to have some extroverts, you're going to have language barriers, you're going to have, uh, you know, just different life backgrounds, you're going to have different economic standings, you know, and all of those factors play into What can I learn? How can I learn? How do I learn best? What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Right. And we're always looking for that equalizer. Now that we've, you know, we're, we're bumping into this online virtuosity, whatever, you know, online all the time kind of system. You kind of hear that, that, that it's it's always on your shoulder in the background. It's like, well, it's tech. So it's, you know, there's gotta be one solution, right? There's gotta be a way to be able to, okay, we can put together the puzzle pieces so that it just works. And, it, and yet we, that's never, ever the case. You know, you have to be able to be flexible. You have to be able to, you know, play the music, so to speak, you know, um, with, within whatever class that you put together. Right. So, I mean, it, it sounds like that's where you're, that's where you're headed right there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now I would say, and I'm going to draw an analogy to, you know, again, coming from the University for Peace, we have students from around the world. And so we're very aware that culture matters, context matters. However, uh, and this is, this is true to the UN too, there's much, much more that connects us as a human family that we share than that's different, mm. right? So I do think that what you know when i have a group of students online there's certain best practices you know that 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 were the same in the classroom is uh are students having you know is there clarity of structure of what's going to happen is there space for interaction is it learner centered is there some differentiation in the pathway they could take is the are the assignments taking into account you know, their why for being in the, in the course. So th- those principles stay the same. Um, the, the technology, 
I, I spent a lot of time. I, I do default to Zoom uh, as, as, the, as the platform that I can handle best in terms of things like breakout rooms, sharing a whiteboard, having people, mm-hmm. you know, maybe I draw a change continuum on and share the whiteboard and people annotate where they are on that. So I, I think being able to handle the technology is essential because then you you might want to do something but you don't know how to do it you know which right. is which is a huge handicap mm-hmm. but then figuring out for that particular group and given your mastery of of the platform exactly what you're going to do that looks different every time just like it would look different in a classroom so um, some of those principles of learner centered uh, design um, I, I stick with. Um, sure. it's, 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 there, there are some variations also given, uh, certainly the, the things that I've tried to replicate, like an activity that I love in the classroom. It's people sitting around in a chair and doing some brainstorming and, and somebody, the person who's kind of challenge you're solving has to turn their chair mm-hmm. so that they're not the, the people who are giving him or her ideas are actually not seeing his or her expression as they're brainstorming. So I thought, how can I, I love that in a classroom. How can I replicate that on Zoom? And turn I figured the, turn it out. the video off. <laughs> exactly. You have to mute yourself and turn your video off. Yeah. So you can, still, you can still listen to your group, but they can't see you. They can't hear you. You can't interject. So there's fun stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then there are other things that, you know, you just have to change. Uh, the recently you know, with the with the situation around you know white privilege and we were we were looking at uh, this idea of the uh, some of you may know the the privilege walk and then mm-hmm. certain things I, I wouldn't try to replicate online I just thought no that that one yeah let let's let's not go there right in, in. so um, it's 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 been to maybe to summarize yes there's a high level of art. And I do think those principles of good teaching and learning um, to a large extent still apply. Mm. So if, if, I, if you can take a snapshot of 2010 to 2020, what have been the most radical changes about how you're delivering courses online? Is, is it truly like tech has changed so radically that it's just things are available, things are there, it's easy. And, you know, whereas before you really had to work and, a lot of setup and you know just it wasn't and, and things are now just sort of hey click 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 and it's done um is it connectivity is available now more is it that just people have a, a better vocabulary and more comfortable um but what are the what are the things what you know between then give me a then and now like what are the pieces yeah yeah you know all, all of the above i think i can't even remember the platform the name of the platform we used to use 10 years ago for for when we did the the webinar piece right um, but it was definitely much more of this top down approach where the facilitator would come with his or her presentation and uh, would be able to share slides, I think. And then there was uh, probably a chat box for questions. So uh, it, 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 we didn't try to make it interactive we figured the interaction could happen on uh, the LMS platform in kind of a, a forum chat, right? So we, we had those pieces separate. And you know, that now with Zoom, um, for example, when, uh, because we, we still have you know, those, those online courses that were created 10 years ago, um, they still exist to allow maximum flexibility. But in the piece where people do come together for that one hour classroom session a week, um, we encourage all our facilitators that that hour should be super interactive. I mean, the mm-hmm. content piece should have been posted as a video or should have been posted, uh, people should have engaged with that prior. So it's a, it's, it's a bit like the flipped classroom idea popularized by, by, by the Khan Academy uh, in the sense that the, the learning, the content we try to have happen before the webinar. And the webinar is really for engagement where we, yes, we do encourage people to turn on the videos. We do these small, even paired chats, you know, pair up with somebody. If there's 22 people on the, on the webinar, you have 11 breakout rooms, come back, pair share. It, it very much feels like an engaged 
uh, room of people having mm-hmm. different conversations coming back together. Um, and I don't, I don't think the technology would have allowed for that. Even bandwidth wise, we wouldn't have been able to, to pull that off. Um, on the flip side, I think a lot of participants are much more comfortable. Um, we have participants from around the world. So I think they, they're much more familiar also with, with online learning. So the, the learning curve for them to be able to engage that way, uh, many have already had past experiences and the ones who haven't, um, they've had similar experiences in a different context. Mm. Um, so it's, it's looking very, very different. Yeah. What's your, what's your favorite fail from the last 10 years? Has it been, you know, an entire, an entire course just didn't go off and, you know, all the videos disappeared. Was it, you know, is, is it always a tech fail or was it, you know, a, a, a teacher fail, like a professor fail? Um, yeah, you know, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to think about how to tell this story without necessarily, uh, I don't know who's going to watch this. If they're like, oh, let me see who's, who are the facilitators. <laughs> we will call them Shireen. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But the, the story is, I, th- I think what one of the things that the Center for Executive Education tries to do is we're, we're friendly and professional, right? So we want people to feel, um, and, and prof- by professional, I mean, like, if you have a question, if you have an email, if on the administrative side, you know what's going on, things are, so, so the friendly is, is like when you're, you know, in, in a class uh, with somebody, your facilitator, you feel they're accessible, you, you know, it's this concept of psychological safety, there are no bad questions. So it, it, we emphasize that because virtually, uh, that's a little harder to create, right? That sense mm-hmm. that my professor is accessible and, and so I think we had one facilitator take that friendly piece way too far, mm-hmm. right? Like friendly isn't necessarily um, if, if I've just got a puppy, I'm going to have my puppy in the webinar and occasionally barking and saying, oh, so sorry. Like, I'm just going to be back in two minutes. That, that I think is, is, is not understanding um, the original idea of, of being friendly. Friendly is to disarm the uh, you know that any tension and any hierarchy, but that's just plain distracting. That's actually interfering with the learning objective. So so we we got um, uh, you know we had a situation uh, where a whole class kind of four weeks went by before we realized wow this is this is like not mutiny. what we had total, mut- total mutiny yeah and and what had happened is life circumstances had changed for a particular facilitator. Mm. And, and they thought that they could incorporate their new life into, um, into the class, including maybe not being so prompt in responding to people and things. So, yes. Yeah, so and, and we realized after that, just like if we had sessions happening on campus and the facilitator walks out, we'd be like, how did things go? And we talk to students at lunch. So we get an informal sense of how are things going? We didn't, you know, we always have an end of class evaluation, but that's too late when mm-hmm. things haven't gone well sure, for four weeks. Sure, sure. So we realized we, we just need to uh, create a way where we can more informally check on progress, even though it's a virtual session. So yeah, that was, that was a big takeaway. Well, <laughs> obvious one, perhaps, but... <laughs> well, you know what? It, yes and no. Yes and no. I, and if I can draw from just my personal experience of what's happening... I, I, as many of the people listening here know, I've, I've got three kids, uh, you know, and all of them have been doing complete virtual learning, you know, during COVID here for the last, whatever it is, three or four months. Um, some of their teachers are rock stars, right? Some of them have just, they, they're either naturals with the technology or are behind a camera or whatever, and they've delivered, you know, at the different grade levels. And some of them have either phoned it in or just, you know, barely made it you know, barely made it to just to getting the learning, you know, in front of the kids. And um, you're, we're left with the sense, I mean, we have a f- pretty highly resourced international school that our kids go to. And so it's just, it's, you, you, you're left wondering as a parent, it's like, where are those checks and balances? You know, how do I uh, raise my hand as, as, a, as a parent in this case and say, hey, you know, I, I don't think this is, I think we need something different here. I think, you know, I think we need some adjustment here. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's, I think we all, it's one of those things where we all know we should do it, 
right? We should all, we all know that we should, but it's, it's just, it's not necessarily that easy or, mm. you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, I think it goes back to that first principle of nobody wants to be told that, Hey, you, you need some constructive criticism, you know, or we, we really need to follow up with that. We can't, we can't let, you know, rest on the, we can't assume that, that, that the person we hired is going to deliver good. Right. And that's always, that's always a difficult thing. Yeah. Where, yeah. So, so where are you at today at, at, with the center is, um, I'm assuming right now that you're not accepting people on campus quite yet. Um, are you total virtual at this stage? We are. We are. Yeah. And so what does that, what does that look like? Have you been, have you moved everything online or have you put some things on hold and you're accentuating other courses or, or uh, you've, you've built new material and you know, new offerings or. Yeah, the, the, that's exactly right. M most offerings. So the, the, the good thing is we did have already some offerings that were completely online. Like we have a diploma in global leadership, uh, five completely online courses. I think it's a very affordable price, less than, less than $2,500. So, mm -hmm. and then we have a similar, uh, diploma in social innovation. Uh, you know, again, five online courses required. There's a menu, um, there's a longer list of courses. So given the, the, the situation where people were working from home, uh, not really being able to go anywhere. There, I, even though economically a lot of people were hit, there were a lot more people who were interested in whether it's skilling up for recent grads or professional development for for people who were continuing in their job. So uh, we did kind of do a marketing push on these two diploma programs that we had, which previously, I mean, 90% of our work was face to face. So our online diplomas, again, they filled a need. We know that we have people who can't travel to Costa Rica, and but we didn't really market it much. And so we did kind of make a marketing push on these two diplomas. Um, and that, that, went, that went very well. I think we got mm -hmm. in about 40 new students. Uh, again, we never have more than 24 in a, in a, on a course, but f uh, across different courses, this worked out very well. We added an element of coaching. Uh, so one-on-one -on -one coaching outside of the, the diploma program, because we did feel that some of these new participants in these online diplomas um, would have actually taken it face to face. So, so we, we kind of offered that higher touch one on one for one on one, -on -one sessions during a certain period of time. So that's what we did with our existing online programs, basically marketed them, yeah, pushed, um, them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. pushed them. Yeah. And, and made small tweaks, uh, on, on the, the, the work that we would usually do face to face, um, so a couple of interesting stories. One is uh, we work with a lot of U.S. universities who want a short-term uh, study abroad experience in Costa Rica. Uh, so most of them have just pushed back to 2021. But uh, for, for one of the universities, we're creating a virtual uh, study abroad program. Oh. Um, yeah, you know, they, they, it's a fairly low budget. We had originally suggested things like, you know, virtual reality goggles for uh, for all the participants in the U.S., then we go out to the field in Costa Rica and create some videos that make them really feel like they're in this, because uh, we do a lot of field visits and things. Didn't have the budget for this. Maybe it's a good thing. It would have been a lot of experiments in one. I was but, just going to say, that's, that's, that is one heck of a deep dive leap for you. to like, oh, we're just going to go do 3D videos. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fortunately, I have a very good friend who is in this space. But, oh, okay, uh, good, but good. what we decided to do is things like, you know, everything from... Typically, when, when a group of students would come to Costa Rica, they would be you know, exposed to Costa Rican cooking and, and, and language and meet people who run these organizations. So you can imagine how you can set some of these up virtually, right? From, from having, sending them the recipe for Costa Rica's most famous gallo pinto rice and beans sure. dish and everyone makes it to, uh, to having uh, um, the, the kind of a case study of, an, of a, let's say, a coffee plantation they would have visited, but then having the owner talk to them about, you know, their corporate social responsibility policy. So, so it's a, it's, we, the, the nice thing for, uh, for us is we had a university that was willing to go that direction. Uh, for the students, it's, it's at a much lower cost. And I do think that depending on how long uh, this no travel situation goes, I can see that more and more universities would say, wow, this is actually a great way to get to our learning objectives. I mean, being in country is, is not the point, right? The point is 
a global mindset. Mm -hmm. So how do we get to those learning objectives if we can't get on a plane and do mm -hmm. history? Right? Mm -hmm. so, so again, that's an educational problem that we're solving and the technology can enable that, but it's, it's fundamentally about what learning, what mindset changes are, are we typically enabling and how would we enable that if, if mm. people aren't in country? Um, the, the other one is just, you know, corporate workshops. Uh, we work with a lot of companies. Um, I'm uh, designing a, a session for, for PNG. Uh, that, that one's, uh, you know, initially it's, it started off as uh, how, how, do we, how do we lead virtual teams? And so, so that first session was best practices and let's, let's you know, it, it, it wasn't rocket science, but then we got into, well, let, we want to talk about psychological safety and, um, and so that session again was one that if I have people in the room um, would be very dynamic exchange of ideas. What can each person do to build psychological safety? So that was an interesting one to structure in a virtual space. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, talking about unexpected changes, I had spoken to the, the team lead and I said, you know, it would be great if, if everyone, just like if they were at a team meeting in the office or in a classroom at UPS, if, if, if everyone's comfortable turning on their videos so we can kind of identify people and then that's part of building psychological safety. It's okay. I can see that in your background, you have a couple of kids running around. Part of it is we need to understand each other's context better. But it started off with the team lead saying, hey, Mohit, I know you'd asked for videos on, but we're having bandwidth problems, so no one's going to turn on their videos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have the whole thing planned out. I love it. I love it. Right. Yeah. So, so when, when people were talking, I, I didn't know who they were. There were enough people on that call. Um, so, so again, one has to uh, adjust, of course, in ways that if I have people in a room and everyone showed up with a paper bag over their face, it's just not happened to me yet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it goes back to that, you know, the human messiness and it's the art form of, of, you know, uh, it's something that we, I, I've talked with, you know, with several of the people on the podcast here and, and over in the e-learning success summit that we did a couple months back as well, where um, you just have to be ready to respond to what is what, you know, what the needs of the learner are. You have to be able to respond to what the situation puts in front of you. And there's just, there's, there's not going to be that, that, you know, either technology bundle that you put together or, or even a pedagogy or curriculum that you put together that's going to be awesome for everyone. And even if you did, even if you did, you know, life will intervene, right? My kids could walk in through the door or, you know, um, the, you know, there's electrical storm and my, my internet goes out or, you know, there, there, there will be something that intervenes, right? Um, yeah, so it's, and, and so, so maintaining that art form, I love, I, I love keeping that real, especially since there's just been so much emphasis on this virtual, or this virtuosity and delivering virtual that it, you know, ultimately we st it still has to, we just have to be, uh, we have to be adult and as you say, friendly and professional. I like that. I like those two pieces. So you're, you're fully online right now. Um, one of the, one of the things I've been asking everybody at the end, you know, sort of the last question here. What's your anticipation for maybe the coming school year? Uh, or, and is there anything either new normal that, that you're anticipating is, is definitely, you know, things are going to stay this way. You know, we, we, we've, we've uh, leaped a frog or, you know, we have crashed the threshold now. We're like, okay, this is, you know, online learning not only is here to say, but most people are going to be demanding it, or maybe there's a new tech or, or whatever. What are your thoughts about, you know, three months, six months out about what, you know, what you're anticipating for, what you're planning for? Yeah, so, you know, may, maybe my answer is uh, being echoed by other people. I, I, I feel that it's probably not very original. I, in the short term, hard to predict, right? Whether it's three or six months, um, it's, a, it's a looking at, at kind of the virus versus vaccination. But I do think if I, if I project forward, even a couple of years, two, three years, I do think that um, thanks to this period, people will be much more open to um, online and, and whether it's the live online kind of format where, where we do have longer sessions with as if you were in the room together to just the online, more traditional online where um, a lot of the learning and uh, sharing happens asynchronously. I, 
because a lot more people have been exposed to it on the kind of student side, <clears throat> students, parents, and then a lot uh, of educators have also, like I said, some of them have been just forced into it overnight, but figured it out, seen some of the benefits. So I think what's going to happen is uh, certainly there are going to be many instances where, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking first about the professional development context. So adult learning uh, companies that are, thinking about where, where there's going to be some, some blend of let's, let's, let's do this leadership, one-year leadership program where only twice a year people come together in person. But let's do all the rest of the stuff online. So we, you know, we have that relationship built right at the beginning. People, people meet, uh, get to know each other. Uh, and, and, so they, and they'll know, the client will know what they're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've experienced it. Because in the past, often... Um, as an educator who's been working in this online space for, for a decade, uh, there were many times I'd suggest an architecture that had a, a blended approach or a strong online approach. But often if I was talking to a client who, who really wasn't, either hadn't had positive experiences or hadn't been exposed to that world, they, they weren't really listening, right? It was mm -hmm. all about what can we do face to face? Yeah, how can you show um, up on an airplane and deliver for us? Or how can we send our students there? Or whatever. Yeah, that was, that was just always the solution. Now that that door has been open for sure. Definitely. And of course, there, there's obviously, you know, some of the cost savings, some of the time savings of being able to learn and engage effectively virtually are, are obvious. So it's, I think it's, <clears throat> it's become much more um, in people's comfort zone. That being said, uh, you know, so, so for example, uh, Harvard had never offered previously a, fully online master's program and the Harvard Ed School decided uh, for, for the upcoming year that they're going to do that. But they said it's a one-time thing, right? Now they've said one time because again, I think they, one they time don't know. Meaning, one time meaning one time in history, we're going to make this decision to continue to do this. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Right. Because right. <laughs> once you've done it once. Oh, you can't, yeah, yeah, you can't open that door and then close it. You just can't, you know, not the age. Yeah. Yeah. So I do think that uh, there's going to be a lot of changes for, for the better uh, on the center side. And, you know, when I think about, you know, my, my program, um, definitely it's going to affect what I, what I pitch people, our suite of, of courses, the level to which our facilitators are now trained and familiar with, again, maybe back to the technology, the possibilities that the technologies offer. Um, and even though this is not my strength, the technical part, I know enough where I say, okay, you know, we're doing this, let's say there's this brainstorm. What does leadership mean to you? I have 22 people in the room. Everybody types in one word and I cut and paste and I create a word cloud that I share with them. You know, so sometimes it's just putting together different things. Uh, but I would never do that if I were in a classroom that would go up on a flip chart or something. And then we wouldn't have that beautiful word cloud. So the stuff that I, I don't want to give up uh, now that I've discovered um, sure. how efficient some of these online tools are. Yeah. Mohit, I know and for everybody who's listening, I mean, I'm, I've known you for super, you know, what we're going on. We're going on 10 years now ourselves. Always a pleasure to talk to you. I really thank you, especially in this, in this tight time for giving up, you know, an hour of your time to talk to us about your experience. Um, I hope that we'll be able to have you back on the show again, you know, sometime in the future. But um, I hope all the best for the center and, uh, you know, for the, new, for the new courses you're putting out there. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you so much for the opportunity, Stephen. Re really, really enjoyed it. Thanks again for tuning into today's episode of the eLearning Podcast. If you like what you've learned uh, today in this episode, I encourage you to either follow us or subscribe to us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. And please do share this episode with one or two of your colleagues or friends. Also, I just want to remind you that you can level up your online learning game with all of the information that's available at the eLearning Success Summit. You can get your free ticket at eLearningSuccessSummit.com. And finally, you can also stay up to date on everything that's important, all the news and the resources for eLearning professionals at LMSPulse.com. Get our free newsletter by just going to LMSPulse.com today. Thanks again.